Uh, okay, uh, baby screaming. Okay, we can't hear it. Just curious, this will be available to view after or live only. Yep, so everyone who registers for a Natchi TV webinar, I'll send you a link to a video recording on YouTube and you can watch it later. So if you have a job scheduled, go do the job. You can always watch this later. All right, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. InterNACHI is the world's largest organization of residential commercial property inspectors. We're a trade organization. And this is a free live online interactive webinar that we do once or twice a month. Um, sometimes I'll teach them, sometimes I'll have a special guest presenting. And um, this one is about performing a home inspection in detail according to the standards of practice. So we're gonna go step by step and inspect a house according to the standards of practice. You can find all of us at natchiorg slash contact. And that's where you'll find all of the staff um, at InterNACHI. And we all essentially work for you. Um, so feel free to contact anybody on staff and ask them, what can you do for my home inspection business? Um, and today is January 17th. So welcome to class, everybody. We're going to inspect this mansion. Um, I inspected it. It's in a cold climate, um, Pennsylvania, and it took me about three hours to inspect. I did about 500 digital inspection images and some video, and we're going to go over most of them as we go through the house inspection. Again, InterNACHI is a federally tax exempt 501c6 nonprofit membership trade organization and headquartered in Boulder, Colorado. And um, if you wanted to visit InterNACHI, uh, that's at nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I.org. And um, if you wanted to see, like, how many inspectors are there in, in the world, you can click that link for our membership stats. And there we are. So we've got this map, and you can zoom in if you wanted to, see where other inspectors are, or you can scroll down the page and see where there, um, how many people, how many inspectors are there in California or in Florida. Um, and then we're international, so we have home inspectors um, all over Canada and all over these countries internationally. The International School is the only nationally accredited tuition-free college for home inspectors accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And we're also a member college of the National Association of Career Colleges of Canada. And if you want to get more information there, visit internachi.edu. EDU is a domain name that um, accredited organizations, institutions, post-secondary education institutions, colleges, universities, we all use .edu. So if you're looking for a school in order to become trained and certified um, and to grow your business as a home inspector, Careful, do research. Not all schools are accredited. Some are, but a .edu is a good indication that that school is accredited. And InterNACHI is a college for home inspectors, and we're also tuition free. Tuition free, it's absolutely free. The education provided by InterNACHI school is free to the members of the trade organization that I just mentioned. So you join InterNACHI as a member and you have free unlimited access to everything InterNACHI provides our members in order for them to be successful home inspectors. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So free online accredited college for home inspectors, that's at internachi.edu. And everything you need all in one place is at nachi.org slash everything, that domain there. So all of these, hope you have a pencil and paper, nachi.org slash everything is where you'll find everything that you need to be a successful home inspector. If there's anything that you need and you can't find it, feel free to contact us at that contact page that I mentioned earlier. And you're on Natchi TV. That's live interactive classes about inspecting, business, marketing, websites. And you can watch the videos there at Natchi TV at that URL, nachi.tv. Watch certified master inspectors perform home inspections and write inspection reports. Don't pull out thousands of dollars in order to get trained and certified as a home inspector. And also, 
Well, because InterNACHI provides everything you need all in one place. The trade organization offers a free online tuition-free school so you can get trained and certified, continuing education to renew your certification or license, professional development classes. We have an online inspection community. We have a network of mentors. We have business and legal documentation and free advice. We have a marketing department that works for you to design all of your marketing, like your logo design, business cards, flyers, and all that design work and consultation is free. So we have everything you need. If you're thinking about going to a school and it costs thousands of dollars to do that, careful. If you want hands-on training, we have that also. We have a network of schools all over the world that provide hands-on training, mentoring, and ride-alongs. So come to InterNACHI at nachi.org and test it out. If you're interested in joining and you're not a member, email me at that address and I'll offer you a big discount. An offer you can't refuse. We'd love to have you join InterNACHI. Let's inspect this house, okay? According to the standards of practice, I'm gonna try to look at your questions as we go along. Um, there's, again, 500 of you just registered for this class. So, um, yep, Russell says, my car window is open so I can't hear it. Yeah, you should probably close your car window and careful driving. Um, let's see, thank you. Uh, okay. Are we accredited in Ohio yet? Ohio hasn't finalized everything quite yet, but you certainly, uh, we have been grandfathering in um, home inspectors and that grandfathering window apparently has been stretched out. So there's more of an opportunity, but every day the board changes almost the regulations. So um, especially in the way they in, are enforcing the grandfathering window. So go to nachi.org slash Ohio if you're interested in more details on how we can help you um, with Ohio in any state or province that you're in. We're gonna perform a home inspection according to the standards of practice, and that's the InterNACHI Home Inspection Standards of Practice, available at nachi.org slash SOP. Uh, let's just quickly go there and check it out. What's it look like? And in your inspection report and in your inspection agreement, you should refer to the standards of practice through a live link because every year our, our advisory council and other master inspectors um, review the standards of practice to make sure it needs, um, if there's any revisions or up, updates um, needed. So what you don't want to do is copy paste a standards of practice in a Word document or something and have it static and you're not aware that it's actually a live document that changes according to um, code changes when it re gets revised every three years, all the codes change every year or three years. And we review everything, the curriculum, we update the curriculum, update the training, update the examination, update the continuing education requirements, and also the standards of practice and code of ethics. So everything is reviewed so that it's always updated and current. So what you wanna do is link out Tell your client the standards of practice to which I performed a home inspection is at natchee.org slash SOP. And it looks like this. It's in sections. Roof, exterior, basement foundation, heating, cooling, plumbing, electrical, fireplace. And let's just say, uh, click something, heating. And it tells you what you are required to do and what you're not required to do. Inspector's not required. There's a long list of things that you're not required to do. There's a short list of things that you are required to do. And in the standards of practice, it's kind of broken up into three uh, tasks, I would say. You have to inspect, describe, and report. So the inspector shall inspect. This is what, these are the housing components that you need to inspect. The inspector shall describe. These are the things you have to describe in your report and describe to your client in detail. And the inspector shall report as in need of correction. These are the list of defects that you recommend getting corrected. Um, for example, any heating system that didn't operate, well, you are required to report upon that as a need of correction, right? Inspect, describe, and report. It's very easy, very minimal. The standards of practice is the absolute minimum you are required to do 
to perform a home inspection. Now, exceeding the standards of practice, we can talk about that. You'll find that your clients are going to ask you to find problems that are not specifically listed in the standards of practice, and you may need to exceed the standards of practice. Um, for example, one could argue that because the word flashlight doesn't appear in the standards of practice, you're not required to use one, but you'll find that in reality, you have to have a flashlight <laughs> during a home inspection, okay? That's an example of uh, the standards of practice being the absolute minimum. It's the absolute minimum you want. You don't really actually want it to be down there because you'll find that when you perform home inspections, you want to look for things that are beyond the standards of practice, right? So you'll be asked to do that as well. And we'll talk about that as we go along in the class, yeah? Oh, and it's also, the standards of practice is also a checklist, essentially. For example, here is, um, let's see, cooling, plumbing, here's the electrical. This is my favorite. The electrical section lists all the things that an inspector shall inspect. The service drop, the overhead service conductors, the service head, the mass, electric meter. So if you're wondering, what should I inspect during an inspection? Well, the standards of practice is essentially a basic, simple, general checklist of things that you need to inspect, that you're required to inspect. So use the standards of practice as a starting point, a foundation upon which to build a great inspection process, and also an outline to write a great inspection report. Every chunk, every section of the standards of practice could be a chapter or a section within your inspection report. It could be, not necessarily. Um, again, let's inspect this house according to the standards of practice. And the first section in the standards of practice is the roof section. Now, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Many home inspectors do. Many in Interaction members have been trained and certified to fly a drone. You have to be FAA licensed as well. You have to take that pilot exam. We have training materials to help you pass that exam. But according to the standards of practice, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Even if it's a flat roof, 10 feet above ground, not required. Not required to bring a ladder either. So the standards of practice also describes your limitations. It describes the scope of your inspection. You're not required to, for example, inspect for every defect in a home. It's impossible. What you're really required to do is report upon those defects, housing issues, problems, that you both see, observe, and deem to be a really bad problem. That's what we're required. So you're not required to find all the, you're not required to find the roof leak if you can't observe it, right? So ideally you want to be able to access a lot of things in the home have everything opened and turned on for you, have the water turned on prior to you showing up at the property, for example. Some inspectors use a ladder so they can get up to the gutter or the eaves or the gable end to take a look, not necessarily walk on the roof. Some use drones. Some use extendable sticks with a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi camera connected to their device. Some use binoculars. Some use other advantage points to look at the roof but you are required to inspect the roof. If you can't see it, I would disclaim it, which means explain to your client why you weren't able to inspect the roof as required by the standards of practice. I was a home inspector who liked to walk upon the roof surface. I got up there. I carried big ladders, 40 foot aluminum for the barns, 32 foot fiberglass, 28 foot fiberglass for the roofs, down to a 12 aluminum, for like um, a one-story roof or a, um, a garage, a detached garage. They're lighter to carry around. Crawl space gear, step ladder to get into the attic space and crawl space um, gear. So I went from the very bottom to the very top. And I exceeded the standards of practice consistently for all my clients, if I could walk upon the roof, so that they knew if they were reading one of my inspection reports and they saw me on the roof, 
they can expect me to try to get up on the, their roof, right? Um, and it's also part of my brand. So what you do is you try to figure out what you're really good at. <laughs> and if you're good at inspecting roofs, you should convey that in your marketing. So if that is part of my brand, which identifies me as a unique kind of inspector, well, how am I different from all of the rest? How do I distinguish my services from other inspectors in my market area? One way was I tried to walk upon every roof surface. I brought big ladders. That's my brand. That your brand is the answer to the question, why should I hire you instead of the other person? And your marketing is the way you send that message, that brand out. So I communicated this. I always took a picture of my feet on the roof and I stuck it in my marketing and my inspection report, which is essentially the best marketing piece that I could create. So if you're wondering whether to exceed or not exceed, don't worry, we have a really good article for you to read at natchi.org slash exceed or not exceed. So these are the pictures that I took during the inspection. And I like to take a picture of just about everything that I'm inspecting. It forces me to inspect everything as much as I can. And I take a picture of every slope, every field, every surface of the roof, and every component that I come across, like this fella, this chimney stack. If you're wondering how to inspect a roof, go to our education page and enter roof in the search field. So we have many courses on how to inspect a roof and um, they're all accredited, nationally accredited. So if you go to our education page at natchi.org slash education, And in the search field here, type in roof. And on the right, all these roof courses will show up. So I like this one, how to inspect a roof, how to perform a roof inspection. And you click it and when you're a member and you identify yourself and you go through the course and it's very easy there are quizzes along the way. There's a final exam at the end. And there's a certificate of completion and your name is on it and the date. And it's a really nice way to educate yourself, to gain the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need to perform a home inspection. We also broke it down into systems. So if you are weak at mm, electrical, you can go to our education page and type in electrical and gain the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need in order to perform an electrical system inspection, yeah? So we have everything you need. And again, the InterNACHI school is tuition free for members. So you join InterNACHI and it's at $49 a month or $4.99 a year, unless you have a discount code. And then that training that you need to become trained and certified and highly qualified and competent for, to perform a home inspection is all online and free. According to the Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the inspector shall inspect from the ground level or the eaves, the roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof from the readily accessible panels, doors, and stairs. So what do we want to do? Let's take a look at the roof covering materials. So that is what we're going to check. And I like to get up close and touch things that I'm inspecting. I often find that when I walk upon a roof, which is dangerous, we do not recommend it. It's not required. It's hazardous. A fall could be fatal. Um, I find things that um, I wouldn't normally be able to see without going upon a roof. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those things that I couldn't see from the ground, maybe. And I'm looking at just about everything. And I like to hug the ridge especially when the roof is steep, so that I can take a look at the roof covering materials and feel very confident when I step down um, from, the, from the roof on my ladder and down to the ground and, and meet my clients 
because I get to the inspection early and I do the roof inspection before my client even shows up. So the, um, I don't take my client up on the roof. So I do the roof inspection. I take all the pictures, all the video, and I make my comments in my mobile software. And I come down the ladder and I shake my hand. I shake the hand of my client and I tell them about the roof condition. And I feel very confident in doing that because I've been up there and I've seen it for myself and I've touched it and I've walked upon it. And I talk about the roof covering material. And you have to use the right terminology, especially when you're talking to your client and writing an inspection report. It's a legal document, essentially. It's written in your opinion. So your mouth is a tool for your success. You have to use the right words. You have to use the right terminology. And to help you write a great report, which reflects what you said during the inspection and what you wrote on all the notes that you took, and it reflects also what you know, the knowledge that you have. We have resources for you, and they're based upon code. In fact, all of InterNACHI's training is based upon the most recent code. So, for example, we refer to the 2018 International Residential Code. And if we go there and take a look at definitions, let's take a look. And we go to roof. There's a section here that has a lot of definitions about roof. There's the roof assembly. There's the roof coating, roof covering, roof covering system, roof deck, roof recover, roof repair, roof replacement. And so you want to use terminology that is accurate and correct. And because we're an accredited school, this is a standard by which all accredited schools develop their courses, you know, based upon, we're not code inspectors, but we use code as a standard by which we can all agree. So if you are up on a roof and you're talking about um, something to a contractor and you refer to something with the wrong terminology, that contractor is going to be um, in conflict with you. So you want to use the same terminology that all certified code inspectors, for example, use. And one of the things that we use is roof covering. When you inspect a roof, you're looking at the roof covering or the materials of the roof covering, or the roof covering materials. And that's defined, that shows up in code. So we're not code inspectors, but we want to use a standard by which to perform an inspection and communicate with our mouth, our words, our report. That's according to a standard. It's very, very simple. Roof assembly is not what you want to refer to. You want to refer to the roof covering. And the roof covering is defined as the covering applied to the deck for weather resistance, fire classification, or appearance. That's the roof covering. That's what you see. You don't see the fastening. You don't see the underlayment. So why talk about it? What you are inspecting is the covering, the roof covering, the roof covering materials. It's not the system. A system is this. It's the roof assembly. That's everything. Let me read it to you. A system. The roof assembly is a system designed to provide weather protection and resistance to design loads. Obviously, the system consists of a roof covering and a roof deck, or a single component serving as both the roof covering and the roof deck. So right there, I can't see the roof deck when I'm looking at the roof with my eyes. Remember, a home inspection is a visual only inspection. It's like putting both hands tied behind your back and inspecting the residential building. So you can't comment upon things that you don't see, just like defects. You can't comment upon defects that you don't see. You can only comment and report upon defects that you both see and deem to be material, really serious. We'll talk about that later. So a roof assembly includes the roof deck, underlayment, roof covering, and also can include the thermal barrier, ignition barrier, insulation, and a vapor retarder. No, you're not commenting upon that. You're not inspecting that. You're inspecting the roof covering, which is that surface material that you can visually observe. So be careful with what you say and how you say it. 
and feel confident that that's how InterNACHI's nationally accredited training programs are based upon. Okay. According to the Home Inspection Standards Practice, a home inspection report shall identify in written formats, in written format, defects within specific systems and components defined by the standards that are both observed and deemed to be material by the inspector. The reports can also include other comments and opinions. So what is a material defect? It's not the roof covering material. It's not the same kind of material. Here's a material defect. A material defect is, is a specific issue with a system or component of a residential property that may have a significant adverse impact on the value of the property or that poses an unreasonable risk. And the inspection report shall identify those defects that are both observed and deemed to be material. And you'll find that your client is going to want you to find other defects. And that's the reality of the situation because um, some clients will want you to identify things that won't have an adverse impact on the value of the property and doesn't pose an unreasonable risk, but they want to, uh, they want to negotiate on that repair with your report describing the problem and your recommendation for it to be fixed. So an example would be um, a crack in tile in the kitchen floor several cracks in the tiles. In fact, let's just imagine that there, there, there's 10 of them cracked, right? That doesn't have an adverse impact on the value of the property and it's not posing an unreasonable risk to someone's safety. But it's a major defect. And you'll find that your clients will just want you to, will demand that you put those types of defects in the report. So when you perform a home inspection, according to the standards of practice, you're required to find only one type of defect, material, that you both observe and deem to be material. But in reality, there are other types of defects. And we can go over that. So are there other types of defects in addition to the material defects that I could observe? Yeah. What kinds? Well, it's up to you to describe them well enough in your inspection report. But one thing you could do is go to our glossary and type in defect. Defect, this is at natchi.org slash glossary. And there are four defects defined in our glossary. One is material, we've already talked about that. The other one is major defect, minor defect, and cosmetic defect. I kind of like these, you're not required to use them at all, but they may be helpful for you to think about how you use your words to communicate your observations. And a major defect is something that's in need of correction repair that we need a contractor to do, like a hole in the roof, right? It doesn't have an adverse impact on the value of the property and it's not posing an unreasonable risk. It's not a material defect. It's not minor. A minor defect is something like a dirty air filter, kind of related to home maintenance, something that a homeowner can do without really any special skills or knowledge. Changing the air filter, every homeowner should be able to do that. Right? They sell to Home Depot, pull it in, pull it out, right? Cosmetic defect is like a stain on the carpet, uh, a dent in the drywall. That's cosmetic. A lot of cosmetic problems do not, do not show up on a, on a home inspection report. Some do. Maybe as just courtesy to your client. So maybe that will help you. Identify, help you identify and describe to your client um, the type of defect the severity, some kind of distinction between a dirty air filter, a crack tile, a hole in the roof, or something that's going to kill someone, right? They're all defects, they're all problems. And you can use a lot of words to describe each one. But your clients, I've found a lot of new homeowners just simply do not understand, is it low priority or high priority? Not necessarily cost, because uh, say a missing GFCI in a bathroom, it's really a safety issue. It's a major defect. It could hurt somebody. It could be fatal, really, if it doesn't function properly and saves. It's designed to save lives. If it's not working. Mm, that's that's a big problem, right? But <clears throat> excuse me, the GFCI itself is 
reasonably uh, less than $100. Hmm. So how do you define it? I wouldn't define it. Mm, careful about the cost being your distinction between a major defect and something that's cosmetic. So careful. The term defect is in our glossary to help you figure out how to communicate in the best way possible your observations. The next thing we need to inspect are the gutters. You can do that from the ground just so you can see the underside of the gutter to see if it's leaking. That'd be great. If it was filled with water and dripping, that's a good indication of a defect, major defect, because you need a gutter person to go up there and fix. If it's cleaning the gutters, maybe it's a service, uh, kind of like a home maintenance thing, kind of minor. So those are the gutters. They look good. They're fastened. I'm not grabbing each one, making sure the fasteners are properly installed. It's impossible. So there's a standards of practice by which you perform a home inspection, which helps you essentially set the expectation of your client that you're not there to find every problem in the house only those that you both observe and deem to be material. You gotta check the downspouts. There's the downspouts. Gotta get them diverting water away from the house. So that one's good, that has a splash block. There's the gutter and the downspout elbow right there. There's the downspout, making sure it's fastened. Don't want any loose downspouts. I like to grab the downspout pipes and see this is a pain in the butt if you cut grass um, to always move that. So what a homeowner could do is take this and go underground and then have a discharge to grade. Not necessarily a defect at all, but it's something that I'm interested in because it could be an indication of water intrusion in the past. So if you see a homeowner discharging downspout pipes far away from the house using big pipes that are obviously in the way. They're very conspicuous and kind of ugly looking, right? Why would they do that? There must be a need to get that water away. So maybe there was a problem of, with water intrusion in the past. So I'm going to have my client ask the homeowner or occupant, have there, any been, have there, any, have there been any problems with water intrusion? you know, water entry, water leaks, uh, flooding in the basement, crawl space, or in the house itself. So I'm gonna use that as an indication that there could be something to follow up on. So to help better communicate particular housing concepts in your report, use InternetG's gallery of inspection images and illustrations. You can also study from these illustrations as well. And we have them in English and Spanish, um, this is rain, and this is drainage, so this is gravel, drainage, uh, wall, drainage, flashing, and um, site drainage. So if you wanted to communicate to your clients particular concepts, if they're having problems with water intrusion with the house, um, and you're, you're trying to inspect, uh, trying to describe and communicate what you are inspecting in relation to rain when it's when it's a sunny day, um, maybe an illustration like this can help you, where you imagine water, rainwater, hitting the roof, being collected by the gutters, controlled by the downspouts, being discharged away from the, so you have site drainage. And maybe if there's water intrusion coming up from the base, maybe there's problems with the, the drainage system, the sump pump system, the underground gravel, Maybe there's flashing problems at where there's components like a deck or a lighting fixture or a window. You know, are the flashing tight, installed properly? Is the flashing diverting water away from the house? Everything around the house exterior should be diverting water away, right? In any climate now, now that climate is changing. So I also wanna make sure that it's attached properly. So I'm taking a look at that. And behind that downspout, I see a crack. And it turns out to be just a stucco coating crack. The foundation is poured concrete foundation and there weren't any structural problems there. But I'll make sure that um, I, I pay attention to what I see on the outside and then bring that knowledge and reference on the inside. The next thing I'm required to inspect are the vents. 
So that's the ventilation roof vents. That's a ridge vent there, and that's the soffit vents there. So the soffits are at the eaves, the underside. And there's soffit vents there. There's also a vent there, if you can see it. And that's probably coming from the bathroom, but I'm not sure. So I'll see if I can take a look at that. There's another soffit vent there, and there's another vent, one of those vents. So maybe the second floor, that's two. So probably the second floor hallway bathroom and the second floor master bathroom have fans in the ceiling, bathroom fans, and they need to exhaust outside by code. We're not code inspectors, by standard best practice. All mechanical exhaust systems for bathrooms need to go outside, all the way outside. And the vents, the soft vents, I can't really see them from the attic, but I know that they were installed there. Flashing, that's where anything of the roof, remember we're still in the roof section, any, anywhere where the roof covering meets something else, like a wall. So there's flashing, there's step flashing, counter flashing at the siding there. I try to see, you know, it's impossible to comment upon all the pieces of flashing. There's hundreds of them, but I'm trying to look for anything like missing flashing in one particular area. So that looks good. Skylights, well, we don't have any skylights on this house. Chimney, hmm, we do have chimneys. So that's a, I, I consider that as a chimney, right? I don't know if there are fireplaces. I'm not sure if this is a a big enough chimney for a fireplace or um, is it the fuel gas from the heating system like a gas furnace maybe there's a gas fireplace hot water tank I'm not sure what's going on but this is a this is a typical common um, fuel gas vent chimney termination and there's another one like hmm all right so I need to figure out what's going on here do I have two fire two heating system to uh, like hot water I don't know but it has um flashing proper flashing and a nice cap on the top and i also have another kind of chimney not really a chimney but this one is from the fireplace and there's actually two fireplaces and this is the the direct vent you could say and there's a fireplace on the inside and on the outside is a, a, a termination where fresh air comes in and the hot air comes out soft gases come out and in the house itself i have two um, gas furnaces gas fired furnaces so uh, that's where the the vents are right so I also probably have a, a fuel fired hot water tank right so and I can see that a couple of things are combined into one termination uh, into one flu uh, type B vent so if you um, want to know more about fuel gas vent terminations chimney stacks and things like that Take in Anachi's free online how to inspect fireplaces, stoves, and chimneys course. Um, let's go there. Take a look. This is an example of what I mean, where um, what you want to do is get really good at, um, you want to know everything you need to know to perform a very good home inspection. So how do you do that? Let's say you're brand new or you're a contractor moving into the home inspection field and you have certain skills and knowledge. Well. You can take our online exam and that'll tell you where you're weak and where you're weak you take training in order to strengthen that weakness and uh, ideally what the, a good idea is what i recommend is find the place find the training school the accredited institution the organization that provides the training for free and online so you don't have to sit in a classroom for five, 10, 15 days, days. Who has that much time to sit in a chair? Maybe you get up and you do, some, there's, a, there's a hot water tank you can touch or something. Or maybe there's um, one or two homes that you go through or something like that. That's not going to make you a home inspector. What you need is a, an accredited home inspector certificate program, right? That's according to a national standard and it's accredited, which means we prove that when you graduate from our program, you actually have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform a home inspection. After you graduate InterNACHI's Home Inspector Certificate Program, you are qualified to perform a home inspection. You are trained and certified to perform a home inspection because we're a college for home inspectors. Other schools, I don't know. I don't know what, the, what standard that, when you graduate, who knows if you are actually competent performing an inspection. 
right? You should be nervous. But if you go to the internet, you are an accredited school. You will have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform the home inspection. So if you um, if you go to the fireplace, oops. So you go to our education page and you type in what chimney. There you go. How to inspect stoves, fireplaces, and chimneys course. And there's um, a chapter on fuel gas terminations. We show you exactly what they look like and we refer to code. We talk about how the minimum height and feet that that fuel gas termination should be. And it's in, according to the slope of the roof. So most, most vent gas terminations, fuel gas terminations that you'll find will have a minimum height of one foot. Because most roofs are from flat to 612 pitch. Uh, flat to 612 slope, sorry. Um, and 612 is really, really steep. So that, that most homes are like 412 slope. Um, those you can walk on, 612 gets a little steep. And if you see a vent, a fuel gas vent termination, it needs to be at least a foot high. That is not, that is very different from the 3210 uh, rule for masonry fireplace chimney stacks, right? They need to be three feet and two feet above anything within 10 feet. So that's a different type of chimney. And how do you know the difference? Don't guess. And don't go to an unaccredited school. Sorry to keep beating on this. You want to go to a training program that will teach you exactly what to inspect and how to inspect it according to a standard. And according to the standards practice, you have to inspect the roof penetrations. And this is anything that comes in contact with or goes through the roof covering materials that we mentioned earlier, right? So it's the vent pipes. There's the vent pipes there. I can't get to them close, close enough, but I'm gonna zoom my camera in and take a picture. Everything looks pretty good. I don't see any tears or damage to the rubber uh, membrane material there. According to home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall describe the type of roof covering materials. And so that's asphalt, asphalt covering, asphalt roof covering, laminated shingle, asphalt shingle, something like that. The inspector shall report as a need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. And we didn't find any. Inside the house, I didn't see any. I like to look at the second floor ceilings, the drywall, if there's a water stain, especially before a home inspection, they usually paint that up. If I actually see a water stain, what I'll do is I'll get my moisture probe and I'll probe it, right? So this is, um, this is a front tool. So it's a, an extendable, it has two um, pins. If something is wet, it'll give me an audible signal and a visual signal. So I'm not measuring anything as a home inspector. I don't have to measure a thing. I can just approximate, for example, the depth of the insulation. And this also helps me, let's see if I can see it in the camera here. There we go. Helps me probe through carpeting into the padding into uh, maybe the basement floor, or the concrete floor, or the wood flooring, the deck, the substrate, something through the carpeting or through the drywall. It allows me to probe when I can touch a, a 10 foot ceiling with this, right? Also, it's a really cool tool. Makes me do a home inspection there. Also, this is the killer, an infrared camera. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And this is a FLIR C2, it's only a few hundred bucks from Inspector to Hobbit. That's where you get all your tools. Okay, where was I? Oh, so, so if I see a stained something, a watermark, a bunch of watermarks, or maybe down in the crawl space, dried watermarks, dried mud or something, I'm going to call that out as a problem. And we need to find out if that is an active leak or dry. Even if it's probed, infrareded, moisture metered, and it's all dry, I'm gonna call it an active roof leak until somebody tells me, nope, that was fixed. Sorry, we didn't paint it. Nope, that water uh, mark was from when the house was built and we just simply didn't mop it up. Okay, great. But until then, I'm going to assume, I'm going to um, 
side on the side of my client <laughs> that it's an active leak and somebody needs to fix it or tell me that it was already fixed or tell my client that it was already fixed. So learn how to write really great inspection reports using InterNACHI's report writing sources, resources. You don't have to go anywhere, anywhere else to learn how to write a great inspection report. We have sample reports that you can look at that are written by certified master inspectors and compare how you write something like a defect, like a watermark. How would another inspector write that up? How do you write your observations about your roof inspection? The inspection of the roof system, right? The roof covering, the gutters, downspouts, and all that. How did you figure out how to write that? What do you say? We have sample reports, a ton of sample reports that you can look at. We have free inspection software. It's a basic checklist. You can use it. I wouldn't use it for your client, but I would use it to practice. So if you're brand new, what you do is get our free inspection software. It's free to members. And you inspect your house 10 times. You want to do a ride along? Forget that. You want to pay somebody to watch you inspect? Forget that. Use our free inspection checklist and it will tell you what to inspect. And you go inspect it. You take a picture of it and you write it up. And you go to the next thing. You do that 10 times, right? And then you get software and you learn how to do the same thing 10 times using software. And you get really good with your software. There's no need to hire somebody to watch you screw up on software that you haven't practiced on yet. So practice on our free inspection software buy software, real software from a software provider that provides discounts to our members and start to learn how to write a report using the resources like the sample reports and the online training courses. We have online training courses that teach you how to inspect a defect, find a defect, inspect it, describe it, and write a report. We also have report writing videos. You can watch a certified master inspector perform an inspection and write a report right in front of you. There's nowhere else you need to go. We also have step 11 at this URL, nachi.org slash everything. If you go to nachi.org slash everything, it's a 15 step checklist on how to become a successful home inspector. So go through step one, step two, step three, yada, yada, yada. Step 11, is where you find all the resources to write great inspection reports. So you, you're not alone. What you have as an InterNACHI member, when you join InterNACHI, a whole world of resources open up to you and they're all free because you're a member of InterNACHI. And this is one chunk of information just to help you write great inspection reports. So I would go through this, if, if you're new, I would go through all of these resources and after you're done, <laughs> you should be a fantastic author of amazing inspection reports. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Oh man. Oh man. Looks like I have a lot of questions. Let me finish up the roof section and then we'll, we'll hit some questions. Okay. Oh, that's it. That was the roof. So, the next section is exterior. We can do the exterior next, but let me see. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah. How will um, students of this class receive the CE credits? Um, what you do is um, you download the certific certificate of completion that comes with the class. So you'll get an email saying, thanks for attending the class and you download the certificate. And then as an internet member, you upload that credit into your education transcript, in your education log, you log it in so that when you um, print out your transcript, if you wanted to, that's recorded in there. Uh, loud and clear, even tile roofs, yes. So Michael, we have a really good course on tile roofs, on how to inspect tile roofs, and even um, some training videos on how to walk a tile roof without cracking all the tiles. Um, what is the maximum slope you, you've you walked? Um, I've done some crazy stuff where my clients were roofers and I followed them up on the roof. That's the worst thing a home inspector can do is follow a roofer on a roof because they're like deer. They just go right up mountain goats. Um, uh, 612 is when I get 
uncomfortable. But I was a home builder before I was a home inspector. Um, I use safety equipment. I've been trained. We have a, a couple um, ladder safety courses. Um, so if you wanted to be safe with a ladder, please don't use a ladder without taking the ladder safety course first from Internet Gene. Again, it's free and online. Um, a lot of people are saying that the audio goes in and out. Um, looks like it's good on my side. Sometimes it's just the glitch. You can refresh your screen or log back in. Make sure your audio is on. Sorry about that. There was, when you registered, there was a little link to test the audio. Um, maybe you could do that. Uh, what is Ben's opinion, that's me, of software that adds dollar or dollars to items of issue? Not quoting a price, but suggesting the expense. To pick. Yeah, uh, I think we kind of addressed that, Amy. That, um, you know, the example was a $50 GFCI is a major defect, actually. So uh, it would be a $1, but it's a major defect that I point out because it, uh, it helps people not get electrocuted, right? So if a GFCI is not working or is missing, um, that's why I inspect the home without any regard to the age of the house because an old 1885 Victorian home was built according to code back then and GFCIs didn't even exist. But when I inspect the home, I inspect it, I don't care when, when the house was built. If there's missing GFCI, for example, uh, missing GFCI protection in the bathrooms, for example, in an 1880 Victorian home, historic home, it's in my report as a major defect. I'm not gonna give it a $1 sign or anything like that. I'm gonna call it a major defect and a recommendation to correct it, excuse me. Hope that helped. Um, Ajit, any idea you can give as to how you can judge the age of the roof? Oh, don't. You don't have to. Um, the age of the roof only is clear to me when it is absolutely at the end of its service life, when it's falling in pieces in my hand, when the top granular surface of the material, roof covering material, the asphalt shingle, is just flaking and in pieces and cracked and that's the only time I can say this is an old roof everything else is just a guess so if my client really forces me to guess the age of the roof I'll take a guess just out of courtesy um, I'll try not to write it down so I don't want anybody to pin it on me what I really will do is um, I'll make sure that in my report I tell my client to ask the homeowner or occupant about the history of the roof performance, or are there any roof leaks in the past? That usually um, starts the conversation about the actual age of the roof and when that roof was installed or last repaired, and why was it repaired. Um, Scotty, reference in the comment about the several cracked tiles in the kitchen floor, you were saying it wouldn't be something to report. I think it was, uh, it's not a material defect. That's That was the point I was trying to distinguish between something that's going to hurt somebody like material defect and cracks in the top. I would report the cracks in the top. In fact, I love it. I love knocking on, uh, I use another stick to knock on the tiles so I don't have to bend over because you do this a hundred times. You know, after 10,000 home inspections, you get kind of tricky. So you, you just, and the sound of tile changes when it, it loses it, it, its adhesion to the substrate. It sounds hollow. And I love doing that. Or with your knuckles, that works too. That's why I bang on the walls of the tile, uh, tile walls of a shower and tub area enclosure, just to see if my hand goes through. And if if my hand goes through, for example, because I'm pounding on the tiles, because if I see a cracked tile in the shower too, I'll, I'm gonna make a recommendation. It's a major defect, it needs to be repaired, because it's not a home maintenance item that a homeowner can fix. I'm going to take a picture of it. If my hand goes through, oh, this is fantastic. Some, some backing in shower stalls are so bad um, that you you can push the towels in and it goes in. It's really bad. I take a picture of it. If I I'm banging on something and it falls apart in my hand, if I if I grab one of those soft brass chrome plated traps under a sink and it crushes in my hand, I don't hide it. I take a picture of it. I found a defect. That's what you are there to do. You're there to break things. If something rotten 
cracks in your hand. If you grab a, a windowsill and it's all rotten and your screwdriver goes right through it and you make a big hole in it, that's fantastic. Leave the screwdriver in there, take a picture of it, put it in the report. You didn't break anything. You're there to find problems. If you hit the garage door opener button and the garage door comes slamming down and falls and into pieces and all the panels pop up and the wheels fall off the drive, that's fantastic. Good thing you're there. Imagine your, your client moving in and them doing that. Guess who they're gonna call? Last person in, that's you. You're gonna be blamed for not reporting on the problems that you found. So obviously, if you find wood rot and your screwdriver goes right through, take a picture of it and report it. So, Chris, I, I sometimes go off on a tangent. Sorry about that. Model of that probe, um, go to inspector coach, inspector coach, inspectorcoach.com and click the tool um, store tab or go to inspectoroutlet.com, inspectoroutlet.com and click the tools. I think they have them there. The, the probe, and it's called a Hydro Shark. Um, Inspector Coach just uses Amazon. You can find Amazon too, but you know she finds the tools for you already. So just click it. And then um, this is uh, called a Corona. It's a three tine ho, T I N E ho. Um, I heated up one tine and uh, straightened it. And the other ones are for hooking things like insulation above a band rim joint, add a band rim joist, and putting it back. And the and the straightened thing is for probing, obviously, you know, so you can probe something and poke it like that. <laughs> and it's extendable. It's actually a gardening tool. That's beyond the standards practice, though. So if you want to stick to the standards practice, don't use any of those tools. Where can we find extendable? Pro yeah. So Pat, David, um, that's inspectorcoach.com, inspectorcoach.com, inspectoroutlet.com. Uh, where to buy the tools, probe like this, still purchase that type of meter. Go to my end, pair it. What a client is asking about the age of the roof, right? We already talked about that. Florida insurance forms require us to put the estimated right. So if you're doing, if you're in Florida, Florida and certain parts of the country are unique, especially the coastlines, because uh, the weather has changed, the climate has changed, and now the wind is much stronger, frankly, right? So now the problem is, um, historically, we have homes with roofs that are not attached to the structure and they blow off. Entire roof systems, including the deck and the structural components, they lift off the house and we don't want that to happen anymore. So down in Florida or on the coastline, you do uh, different kinds of inspections. Um, it's not according to a home inspection, it's according to like a, a roof certification or a, um, a wind mitigation inspection, sorry. And you're looking for how that roof is secured down. It's even fastened um, and adhered uh, differently, according to the standard. There's different standards by which, um, if you're down in Florida, you perform a roof inspection. Like a lot of insurance companies just want to know about the roof, right? Um, there are other types of inspections, like four point inspections, where you inspect only four systems in a home and not the entire home. Does an inspector determine the line between exceeding the standards of practice for the customer benefit oops, of the client and opening themselves up for liability, for example, garage door resistance test? Yeah, great question, Amy. Um, so there's 10 steps to perform a garage door opener inspection according to a standard. The 10th step is really optional to you. They're all optional, okay? You just, um, there's a couple things in the standards of practice, home inspection standards of practice you're required to do. But in InterNACHI's training, we have a 10 step checklist. And you bring that checklist into your mobile software so you can remember all 10 steps. And the 10th one is the um, physical contact test. And we don't recommend using your hands. We're, we recommend the physical contact if you're going to do it um, according to a national standard by DASMA, uh, which is using a, um, a flat line two by four board. Uh, you could keep a two by four, I don't have my toolbox, but you can put a two by four about a foot long in your toolbox, tool bag, and just pull it out. And you lay it flat and you close the garage door with the garage door opener, normal operating controls, and it's supposed to bounce back. That's the physical resistance. You don't have to do this stuff because we're, there's no standard to this. Like my this is different from Amy's this. 
and how do we know if this is good or Amy's this is good? We don't. It's so dumb. So Internet Chief's uh, training is based upon national standards, and we caution you in doing this resistance test, and uh, we refer to you to a national standard on how to inspect a garage door opener, and we'll talk about that later. Good question, Amy. I put number of years with proper maintenance or something to that effect, David. I put number. I'm not sure if that's a question, but um, in relation to maintenance, we have a home maintenance book. Um, Internet actually produces publishes a home maintenance book. You can buy one or a hundred or a thousand um, at a low price of two dollars and seventy cents. You get a discount as you um, buy more. And you hand that out to every client and their agent and the homeowner or home seller's agent and the homeowner. So there's like four home maintenance books that you need to hand out during every inspection. Why? Because it's a physical weight to your service. Because we're in the electronic world, my reports are in the cloud, I barely bring any paper, I now strike credit, credit cards, right? All these things are online. Rarely do we print anything out. I'll print out a summary, which is the top things, the major material defects that need to be fixed immediately, and they can start negotiating over it. And I'll attach that to the top of, um, I'll put that on top of my home maintenance book, which is a 100 page home maintenance book published by Internet Sheet. It's only a couple bucks. A lot of people don't do it because they're, they, they think it's too much. It's like $2. Oh, man, that's like $10. I hand out four for every inspection. That's like, oh, that's a lot of money. No, just raise your fee $10, but raise your fee $5 and give out one home maintenance book. Now your client is essentially buying their own home maintenance book off of you and enough money for a cup of coffee. That's how I see it. Don't add to your overhead, right? Increase your fee and have someone else, your client, pay for that product, right? So um, inside the home maintenance book are these life, service life um, expectancies in years. You may be interested in that, um, David. Okay, let's see. Can you change, can they charge you if anything breaks? I mean, anybody can sue you for anything, but you're there, you've already agreed. The, the home seller, this is a real estate transaction, the home inspection during real estate trans transaction, the home seller has already agreed to having a home inspection performed according to a standard. And in that process, um, if you pull on the window blinds and they fall, right? I'm gonna take a picture of it. I'll try to put it back because I think I can put back a window blind that falls. But if it doesn't, that's okay. You're supposed to find problems, even to the point of window blinds, right? You move a slider door and it falls off its track. It's not your fault, right? you are there to find problems, then this is a problem. When the slider door falls off its track, take a picture of it, make sure it's not gonna fall on anybody. You know, the one time I, it's I want a couple of times, but one time I inspected a deck from below and the main load bearing beam was completely rotten. Nobody knew about it because it was capped with aluminum. I went up, I informed everybody, no one is allowed to walk upon the deck because the deck could collapse. It's imminent. I love saying that word. That means it will fall. So if you step on the deck, it's going to fall and kill you, right? So um, those are the kind of things that um, I didn't force the deck to fall, but I tagged it as an imminent material defect, a hazard to someone's safety, and I told everybody just don't rock on it. So. Just because it hasn't broken or fallen, the deck doesn't mean I don't have to put it in a report, right? I'm there to find problems. And if they happen to crack or fail in my hand, well, all the better. Somebody should be, you should be turning your back looking for a pat on the shoulder. <laughs> so you're there to find problems. Now, if you break something, right, that's not really part of the inspection, then it's on you. For example, you know, I've done 10,000 home inspections, so I have a lot of examples. I was inspecting something, I forget what it was, but it was behind a TV set or something. I was trying to look at a corner or something, and my head went down, and as my head came back up, I hit this shelf. 
this little shelf and there were ceramic baby shoes on it and the shoes fell and cracked. It was just terrible because it was like, whose, whose baby shoes were that, you know? And wait a minute, why were they on a wall behind the TV hung by two pin needles? It was like a booby trap and I'm the booby and I, I got trapped. And so I paid for them, right? They were very special and all that stuff. So I made the client whole. I made, sorry, the homeowner whole. So when, when it failed, right? made a big deal out of it, apologized, took pictures. I wrote a handwritten letter to the homeowner because they weren't there. I scooped it up and I put it down. I wrote my uh, contact information, left my business card, told them I will pay for everything. I paid for the replacement of it, right? And I made sure that everyone knew about it. Because when you make a mistake and you kind of hide it, like and someone finds out later, it's no good. So when I made a mistake, I made sure I made the other person whole and then I told everybody about it. And all the real estate agents love it because later on it worked. They actually referred to that. Remember when you broke those shoes? You know, well, you made them whole, you know, you made you fixed it and everything was great. Now, when somebody refers work to you, they know if you make a mistake, you're gonna own up to it, you're gonna be responsible, you're gonna make people whole. So it doesn't matter because mistakes happen. The problem is when you make a mistake and you try to run away from it, right? So I also tripped the GFCI in a garage and I destroyed a lot of cold wine, right? I paid for that wine. I brought a replacement wine, a check and flowers. And I made everybody whole and I made sure everybody knew about it. They talked about that wine replacement for years later because they know if I make a mistake, everything's gonna be okay. But finding a defect is not a mistake, right? Having a shingle slide under your feet is not a mistake they're not supposed to slide shingles that slide under your feet are not fastened properly take a picture of it hope that's clear hope that helped okay let's keep going we're on the exterior right according to home inspection standards practice the inspector shall inspect the exterior wall covering materials eve soffit fascia representative number of windows all exterior doors representative number of windows you know the second floor windows you can't even get to but all the exterior doors Maybe one, two, three, four exterior doors. You should get through them all. Flashing a trim, adjacent walkways and driveways, stairs, steps, stoops, stairways, ramps, porches, patios, decks, balconies, and carports, railings, guards, and handrails, vegetation, service drainage, retaining walls, yada. So let's do exterior wall covering. And we use exterior wall covering because that's what code refers to exterior wall covering. Um, so the exterior wall covering is a uh, brick. We use exterior wall covering in your report. Why? Because 2018 IRC chapter two definitions refers to exterior wall covering. So we'll uh, we'll just leave it at that. We already went back for um, roof covering, remember? So your terminology is important. Uh, so it's um, siding, even if it's observed from walking on the roof, um, that's vinyl siding. So there's brick. Vinyl siding, there's vinyl siding, basically vinyl siding house. There's other materials like the stucco on the um, exposed foundation wall at the top of the foundation wall. And the tree is in contact or very close to the house, the branches. So I'll actually report that. You can become a certified tree inspector through Internet if you'd like. We have an online course. and. Um, so I'll mention that the tree is in close proximity to the house siding. And some of the exterior I can't get to because of the dense vegetation. And some of the windows I can't get to because they're above my head. But I'll take a look at the mortar joints of the brick and look for cracking of masonry. When you're looking at masonry, basically you're looking for cracking and plumbness. Looks real good. I like to check where different materials come in contact with each other. So the masonry uh, reacts differently and moves differently, expands and contracts differently than vinyl siding. Vinyl siding is always moving, expanding, contracting. And so there's gonna be a little separation. So it'd be good to have some flexible sealant there, exterior grade sealant there, where the two materials meet. There's um, side of the house, you can see the fireplace. There's the flashing there around the curved windows, looks good. 
there's a door actually there, not used as a door, but it could be opened up. And at the bottom, I like to see like at a window or a doorway, I like to look at the bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. I like to go counterclockwise. And I like to look for wood rot down there and deteriorated paint and up here, flashing problems and cracking. So it looks pretty good. Oh, behind this um, grill, what's it called? Um, where vines grow up, trellis. Um, and behind it, like a, a chair, a couple of chairs, and there's like this ornamental thing. Um, it's just coincidence, I'm sure. They weren't trying to hide the melted vinyl siding, but there's melted vinyl siding there from a grill that used to be there and got too close to the vinyl siding and it melted the vinyl siding. And um, I'm looking, I like to touch things, I like to show um, the judge that uh, if I ever get pulled in small claims court, that I got as close to the problem areas that I suspected as much as possible. There's a, my hand touching um, the door tread of one of the doorways, exterior doorways. And again, bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. Um, there's some wood rot and deteriorated paint at the garage door, no big deal, just can be painted up. So again, I'm tapping um, certain sus suspect areas um, for wood rot, and I like to use a combination uh, six and one uh, screwdriver. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of fittings, and you can use this to take uh, certain panels off of a heating system off, right? So, um, but I use it as to tap, um, to look for wood rot. Tapping, usually it's, um, it's a great way to find wood rot using your ears after you tap. To help identify house components, we recommend studying the illustrations in International's gallery of inspection images and illustrations at natchiorg slash gallery. And these illustrations can also boost the quality of your inspection report. So if you're trying to describe what a softener fascia is to your clients, you can just stick this illustration, high definition illustration into your inspection reports and this will help you. So there's the, there's the fascia, the vertical board and soffit and soffit vents and this is the ease. Okay. Next thing, a representative number of windows and we'll, we'll take a look at the windows. The problem is the inspection restrictions. So I make sure that my inspection images are not taking just pictures of things that I inspect with my eyes, but everything else, particularly the inspection restrictions, because I just can't see everything. I mean, look at this thing. Who knows what's behind there? There could be a huge hole in the siding. Now, is that gonna show up in my inspection report? No. Am I required to report upon that hole in the siding behind this bush? Nope. I'm required to report upon the defects that I both observe and deem to be material. So that could be a material defect. I don't know. Maybe it's a lot of termites or something. But if I can't see it, Your Honor, I can't report upon things that I don't see, that I can't see. And look at this big bush here. I can't see it behind that. This is a visual only inspection. Yep. Understand what the standards of practice is used for. It's the basis foundation upon which you build a really good inspection process because you know what you're required to inspect and what you're not required to inspect and what you're not required to report. There's a window well. I always take a look. Looks okay. A little covering. All exterior doors. I took a look at all the exterior doors. They look good. This one is not used. I mean, there's, there's furniture there, you know. So um, it's a trip hazard. If you're going to, so in my report, I'll comment if you walk out this door, you know, you're going to trip because um, uh, it's a long way down. Uh, adjacent walkways and driveways. So I took a look at that. There's a crack. It's been patched. No big deal. The patio looks good. The driveway asphalt looks great. A little puddle, but, you know, it shouldn't be there after 48 hours. Stair step stoops, balconies, decks, carports, railings, handrails. Everything looks good. One loose tile at the corner of this um, entry patio. No big deal. So all that is looking great. Vegetation, surface drainage, retaining walls, 
and grading of the property where they may adversely affect the structure due to moisture intrusion. This is a concern. I'm gonna make note of this, a mental note in my head when I get into the house. I think there's a full basement. I'm gonna take a look at the basement to look for any reason why this huge big hose was attached to the downspout. But the grading looks good. It's just there's a lot of vegetation. I can't see everything. I have no idea what's going on in there. It's like a jungle in there. Bushes up against the house. It's okay. But the trees, the full adult trees um, up against the house is no good, especially where the branches come in contact with the exterior covering. The inspector shall describe the type of exterior wall covering materials. That's easy, vinyl, brick. And there are other components on the exterior. You can inspect, you can inspect them now and where you put them in the report is really up to you. Um, exterior faucets, I put them on the exterior. But you can put them under plumbing, like a plumbing section. Um, you're not required to inspect fences, but I will uh, out of courtesy, especially if I see a defect like that. And all exterior receptacles need to be GOCI protected. And there are other components like this dryer vent hood. The inspector shall report as a need of correction any improper spacing between intermediate balusters, spindles, and rails, and we don't have any. We're at the basement now. Basement foundation crawl space and structure. According to the home inspection standards of practice, the home inspector shall inspect the foundation, basement, crawl space, and structural components. Let's just do that all at once, right? With all that in mind. However, it's a visual only inspection. Half the basement is finished, can't see everything. So I'm taking pictures, I'm gonna put these pictures, at least three of the inspection restrictions in my inspection report so that everybody knows that I can't see everything. Look at all this stuff. So I'm required to inspect the type of foundation and location of the, um, location of the access to any crawl space, but we don't have a crawl space. The type of foundation is poor concrete foundation. Very common in this area. It's hard to inspect everything. I can't see everything. It's a visual only inspection. So I'm just going to look for major problems. The foundation floor, the floor of the house is wooden two by tens. They're insulated. I can't see everything. Insulation looks pretty good. It's an unfinished, unheated, unconditioned basement. That's great. I'm not required to remove um, or move drop ceiling tiles. There's a lot of them. I have no idea what's going on above my head. Not required to inspect furniture, I move furniture, sorry. So there's a lot of restrictions. The carpeting obviously is covering the basement concrete floor. But what I'm really looking for, uh, looking for is um, signs of water intrusion with watermarks and structural problems in the basement. And here I do find that. And it seems like it's coming from the kitchen sink above. So I have a couple of water lines, um, plastic pipes, uh, hot and cold, and it's going to a, a drain pipe. So that's, um, there's something, go and there's watermarks below it, and the insulation has been removed. So I'm gonna put this in the report as an um, observed indications of active roof leaks. And I'm gonna recommend that my client ask the homeowner about this prior roof leak, uh, prior plumbing leak, and to see what's going on there. I also have a crack in the foundation. And this is just below an exhaust pipe, right? Through the foundation. And those two could be related, a duct going through the foundation wall. And um, that's about all I need to do. I'm gonna look for a large opening or a displacement. So I don't want the wall surface to be like this or displacement, I don't want the crack to open up. It is a poor concrete foundation, so it has cracked at the weak point, which is okay. There are no control joints. If there was a control joint here, it may have cracked along the control, control joint, which is okay, because when the, the concrete dries and cures, it shrinks a bit. So this is a shrinkage crack, pretty typical. However, the watermarks make it different. So I see watermarks, I see efflorescence, which is the salt deposits left behind when um, moisture moves through masonry and then dries. Um, if you want to learn about efflorescence, um, we have a, 
a training program about efflorescence and a couple inspection articles about identifying moisture intrusion in um, masonry and efflorescence. So I'm going to put this in the report. See, it's nice and tight. The crack is nice and tight as it goes down towards the footer. So it's a typical hairline crack. In fact, the crack actually just disappears before it gets to the footer. So um, typical crack, but the concern is there's water. And I'm sure it was just coincidence that um, they put stuff in front of the crack, like the window screens. So um, I'm going to put that in a report as an active roof leak. Uh, sorry, as an active leak moisture intrusion through a hairline crack of the foundation wall below the duct. So I'm going to take a picture of that. And somebody needs to come in. It's probably going to be an easy fix with um, epoxy sealant. So they're going to squirt some glue into that. Um, the epoxy sealant is a structural bond between the, the pieces of concrete. And um, it's actually stronger than the concrete itself. So I'm looking for um, water intrusion. Remember those downspout diverter pipes going far away from the house? A little, little bit of a concern there. So I'm looking for reasons why. And here's a reason. So I don't see any water marks on the wall, but there's dirt on the floor as if dirty water was on the floor and the water evaporated and left the mud. So you can see, like, they didn't mop it up or anything. There's stuff, furniture on the floor. The bottom pieces here are not wet. They're not rotten. They're not watermarked. There's um, particle board here, which absorbs water very easily. It's not dry. Um, it's dry. It's not been damaged or watermarked. So this could be something in the past. I don't care. You know, I see, I'm not there to diagnose problems. I'm there to report upon problems that I see, observe. And this could be an indication of an um, active leak or a prior leak. And I'm going to write that in a report. And we want further information. Don't need to be an investigator, a diagnostic, a diagnostician or something. You don't need to diagnose the problems. You do need to report upon the problems that you find, though. There's cardboard boxes. If, these, if the bottom of the cardboard boxes down in the basement were deteriorated and damaged, yep, that's a good indication. But it seems like this is from when the home was built. But I don't understand why the builder didn't wash it off completely, seal the basement floor, or the homeowner didn't clean up. So um, I don't know. This is as far as I want to know, though. I'm just going to report upon the things that I see and ask for further information or correction or repair or something like that or monitoring. This is a moisture meter. So again, I'm probing again through the carpeting of the basement along the exterior walls, looking for any kind of moisture indications. I'm using my extendable three-tine hoe to move insulation, looking for water marks or water intrusion. To get your inspection tools and equipment, go to inspectoroutlet.com and click the tools tab on the left. Go to inspectorcoach.com and click the store tab on the top. The inspector shall report as a need of correction, observed indications of wood in contact with or near soil, observed indications of active water penetration, and we have that. Obs observations, um, sorry, observed indications of possible foundation movement, such as sheet rock cracks, drywall cracks, brick cracks, out square door frames, and unlevel floors. We have a uh, foundation crack. Observed cutting, notching, and boring of framing members that may, in the inspector's opinion, present a structural safety, structural or safety concern. We don't have that. So we have that crack in the foundation. We have indications of water intrusion. Heating is next. And to learn how to inspect the heating system, don't worry. Internet actually provides everything you need, especially if you're trying to learn how to inspect something. So you visit our education page and you type in HVAC. So again, it looks like this. Go to our education page, use the search thing and type in HVAC. And on the right, I like this one, Advanced HVAC Training for Inspectors. And it's basically a, a video, primarily a video course um, with all these videos. And it, it's a really great course. We went to a community college. Thank goodness for community colleges because we've lost that knowledge on how to do things 
practical things in our homes with our hands. And we went to a community college, we got an expert instructor, and we tore apart a ton of heating and cooling equipment appliances and inspected the heck out of them all and recorded them in this course. So it's really good. Every component of every kind of appliance, um, we tore apart and explained how it works, how the component works as part of the system. A system is, a, is a, like a bunch of interdependent parts all working together. And when one part of the system doesn't work very well, well, it affects other parts of the entire system. So when one um, part of a burner of a heating system doesn't work, well, it's going to affect the entire system. According to Home Inspection Standards Practice, the inspector shall inspect the heating system using normal operating controls. What, are the, what does that mean? Thermostats. Thermostat, thermostat. I have three thermostats in this house. Hmm. And emergency shutoff switches. So if you wanted to turn off the electricity supply to the heating systems um, from afar, from a safe distance, you can't. So we have two heating systems there. Uh, there's the zone controls. That's why I have three thermostats. So we have dampers on the ducts near the furnace. The, the difficult part is um, determining where the conditioned air goes, right? From which system. So you can put your hand on, you can use an infrared a camera, a thermal laser point. Um, this one is pretty dirty. This was down in the basement. And man, that register is all nasty, dusty, and dirty. That's kind of fun figuring things out. And there's a shutoff switch, so that's a normal operating control as well. You turn that off to get to the air filter. And there's two systems, so there's two switches. We have a free gas furnace inspection checklist available. If you wanted to inspect, why don't you download, here's a good idea, download this checklist, it's downloadable, and inspect the heating system of your own home, right? So go to this URL, natchee.org slash home hyphen inspection checklist. So the internet has everything you need. And there it is, gas furnace inspection checklist. You click it and you can um, download the word format or the PDF format, either way. Or you can just use this to um, create your own. And every bullet point is essentially something to check or report upon. So um, it's a big checklist. So what you do is you grab these free inspection checklists that Internet actually provides and you incorporate them into your mobile software that you're using so that when you're in front of the gas furnace and you want to inspect it, you can go by the standards of practice, which is the absolute minimum, or you can go by a checklist, which you can customize to suit your needs. And you look really smart because you're not missing a thing. Having a checklist, an inspection process checklist with a mobile device does two things. It reduces mistakes, so it reduces your liability, and it makes you more accurate, right? Same thing. But you're not guessing and wasting time, so it makes you more time efficient. You are a better manager of your time. So you increase your efficiency and you make more money. Well, let's say you make, let me explain. Let's say you make $500 during an inspection, but it takes you all day, right? You're not making a lot of money. It takes you eight hours to do a $500 inspection. So what you want to do is you want to increase gross revenue and InterNACHI has resources to help you increase your gross revenue. And we also have resources and training to be more efficient in your time. So what you want in business is a fraction where the numerator, the top, is really big. The amount of money, the gross revenue, is divided by a small amount of time. You want to shrink your time by becoming more efficient. I'm not saying run through the house and blow things off, right? No, you want to inspect everything, but be efficient with it. So get some mobile software, incorporate the standards of practice as a foundation, and enhance your inspection process by incorporating InterNACHI's inspection checklists according to your needs. So you can get very good, reduce your liability, and reduce your time, and you make more money, right? 
um, let's see. So download that checklist and inspect your, uh, if you're not going out on a date tonight, inspect your heating system tonight. <laughs> you got a date with your heating system tonight. Um, according to home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall describe the location of the thermostat for the heating system, the energy source, and the heating method. That's very easy to describe. And the inspector shall report as a need of correction any heating system that didn't operate or you couldn't access it. So let's go to the thermostat. I'm going to describe the location of the thermostat with a picture of all three thermostats. Energy source, gas. I see gas. That's C CSST um, tubing, um, supplying gas to the furnace. And we talk about that yellow jacketed or black jacketed um, tubing. And there's a difference between the two and it's bonding is the issue. And no big deal if you see that. There's a couple of things you need to know and we have the training for it. Um, on the outside, when I was doing the exterior, I uh, tripped over this. This is a buried gas tank. There's a tank underneath the ground. Um, according to home inspection standards of practice, you're not required to inspect, not responsible for anything that's buried actually. So, but I see this and there's a couple gauges. I'm gonna take a look and there's some standing water in there. So I'm gonna report that and then the pipe comes up and there's a shutoff valve and a pressure regulator before it goes into the house. Wouldn't worry too much about the surface rust. I'll comment upon it and the heating method. Well, that's duct work. So if you see uh, air filters, um, that's forced air. So that's the heating method. Report as in need of correction, any heating system that didn't operate, we didn't have any, everything turned on and everything was accessible. So I'm gonna take a look at the controls, normal operating controls of the heating system, each one. I don't like how the condensate um, is draining into the basement floor. It should be draining into a condensate pump. That's why they created condensate pumps to discharge that condensate out, to control that condensate out. In the summertime, gallons of water can be produced by the air conditioner and it drains and it's supposed to drain what? Through a hole into the gravel, drainage gravel. Remember that um, the Spanish terminology of drainage gravel in the illustration from our gallery? supposed to drain into that and then what happens after that it goes into what is there something there's no sump pump there's it just goes what so if you wanted to finish the basement you're dumping two air conditioners running in the summertime dumping gallons of water underneath your basement floor and you have a finished basement really nope so it should be collected um, and discharged outside properly um, so that there's two, um, I test the safety switch when you open up the furnace with the panels with the, in front of the blower door, that should be turned off. I open up the panel um, in front of the burners. We got three uh, ports here with the manifold. I'm just looking for um, anything obvious, anything abnormal. And one of the things I see is a lot of rust on the burners. You can see the ports. See the rust, surface rust? What is the rust doing there? Well, it could be excessive heat or um, water, which shouldn't appear at all. Oh, there's a fan, a draft inducer fan, a draft assist fan, um, and the food pipe is metal. So I have a draft fan with a metal blue pipe. That means it's not category four. It's not a condensing furnace. There isn't any condensate that's supposed to be produced in the exhaust connection pipe coming from the furnace, the fuel-fired furnace. This is a category one. Now, what are these categories? We'll go over it, but it's not supposed to be condensing water, but I see this. Mineral deposits coming from water condensate in the flue pipe as a defect, improper combustion, could be a venting problem. I want an HVAC technician to further evaluate because not only do we have indications here that I observed, but we have rust and corrosion below. So we have a major defect. Man, when I find a major defect like this, it could be a safety issue, it could be a serious problem. I get all happy and giddy because I'm charging about 
500 bucks. I'm thinking, man, I found problems on the outside, the exterior, the structure. Yep. Now I'm bringing incredible value to my client. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to overwhelm my client with incredible, valuable information. Because in business, if the, if the general rule is, if the perceived value, if the perceived value is much greater than the cost, then it's a good decision. It's a good product or service, right? That's what I want to do. I want to overwhelm my client with so much information that's so valuable to them. They feel good about my fee. That way I can increase, I can increase my fee. That's one way to increase your fee is to make sure that you are providing incredible, overwhelming value to your clients. There's several ways you can do that. And we teach that in our business and marketing courses. Can you identify the furnace type or category or efficiency? If you can't, you go to our free online How to Inspect HVAC Systems course. And there's a chapter called Four Furnace Categories. And um, there's this nice little table about um, if it's condensing or non-condensing and uh, if the pressure in the flue is negative or positive. And there's category one. Category one old uh, furnaces have a draft hood and they just don't make them anymore. So if you find a furnace with a draft hood, uh, it's beyond its service life expectancy. It could be replaced. Um, this one has a, a draft assisting fan. Remember the fan on our furnace? Well, here's a nice little illustration. Um, what it does is it sucks air through the burners, through the burner chambers, the combustion gas goes through the heating system and the draft fan um, essentially pushes the exhaust outside, right? So that's a mid efficiency. They're about 80% um, efficient. And if you see a draft assisting fan, um, that's uh, category one, 80% um, mid-efficiency fuel-fired heating system. Category four, um, uh, category two is uh, commercial stuff, and um, category three is oil uh, furnace uh, things. Category four is very common, too, because it's high efficiency. We're in the 90% um, efficiency or greater, which means it burns, it uses most of the fuel, very little um, uh, heat is um, and, and fuel is wasted up the flue. Um, and there's a secondary heat exchanger to grab that extra heat. And in doing so, um, water condenses inside the exhaust uh, flue vent pipe. And so you'll find um, plastic pipe for the vent. Okay, so if you wanted to learn about identifying the type of furnace that you're inspecting, you should be able to identify the type of furnace or the category or efficiency. So you can so you can speak with your mouth words that you know will be written in your report that are um, technical and accurate. Um, make sure you can uh, make sure you go to the right training program. So there's the blower and all the controls. I have condensate dripping out of one of the air conditioner pipes, and it's actually dripping wet. That's my hand um, and it's wet. So that's why that the other furnace has rust and corrosion on it. So that's a major defect. I'm gonna get that inspected by an HVAC technician and corrected. There's um, a humidifier in the winter time. If you wanna humidify your air, you do it like that. Um, that needs to be replaced. All the filters need to be replaced every year. And that also drains into the floor, so. Um, in the winter time, there's gallons of water draining into the basement floor. It's just not a good idea. It's just a cheap thing from the, the builder. Cheap way to handle the condensate. There's two duct dampers to control the heating and cooling. And speaking of cooling, according to the home inspection standards of practice, the inspector shall inspect the cooling system using normal operating controls. And it's just like the heating system. Describe the thermostat location and the cooling method and report any cooling system that didn't operate or was deemed inaccessible. So on the outside, I take a picture of the manufacturing labels. Um, I don't put them in the report, but I may use them later in order to figure out maybe the age or the size or if there's something wrong or if somebody needs to refer to something. Electrical service switches within sight of the units. 
the, the, um, the electrical lines, the conduit, the liquid line, the suction line is insulated. The base is fine. The fins are not damaged. Looks pretty good. I just don't like to condensate. Plumbing is next. Let's see. Do we have questions? I'm not sure. Amy says, I'm not trained for mold or asbestos or by suspect mold or the house is of the age for possible asbestos. What do I put in that as high priority or low? Um, you can become a certified mold inspector through Interaction. We have a mold program, a training and certification program. You get a logo. You can perform a mold inspection. And we have um, connections to laboratory resources. Um, the world's largest laboratory is ProLab down in Florida. We have a connection with them, a partnership with them. And they can get you equipment. What I did was um, I had the equipment to perform a, an entire mold inspection, but I carried, sorry, I just, I keep looking around for my tool bag. I don't have it with me. I carried um, a swab sample. So if I suspected mold, I turned around to my client and said, while I'm here, um, I want you to know that I, I see, I observe some areas of moisture intrusion or some mold or so there's something going on there. If we, if you want to confirm that it's mold, I have to swipe it um, because um, who knows, it, it could just be something dirty. So if you wanted to tell your um, client that it's actually mold, you have to ask them permission. Would you like me to, while I'm here, it's a good way to start off selling ancillary, ancillary profitable services. While I'm here, would you like me to swab, for example? While I'm here, you want me to do a radon test? While I'm here, would you like a, a mold sampling of the entire home? Um, that's one way to um, sell ancillary services, using the terms, using the, the phrase, while I'm here. And we also have, in our marketing department, you can order a pack of rack cards that help you sell ancillary services. And that's one way to increase your gross revenue. Not just to do a home inspection, but to do a home inspection with a radon test and a mold sampling. That's, that's a lot of money. And if you can do it without increasing your time, keeping it efficient, then you're doing really well. You're being very profitable. So um, asbestos is different. Asbestos is hazard, health hazard. And if I saw um, indications of asbestos material, I would say it's, you know, potential. I observed something that looks like something else. Like, and I, I think it's mold or I think it's asbestos. And I recommend further evaluation by a professional. Can't take asbestos sampling, can't take lead sampling, although I was. I was a, a EPA certified lead hazard risk assessor. Um, so if you're not trained and certified to take sampling, don't. But I would write my observations that I observed indications, write in past tense, I observed indications of possible mold growth. And I advise my client to take a mold sampling. And then you can have them actually sign something that says, I refuse to take a mold sampling, even though my home inspector found it. Hmm. Um, do you encourage anyone to obtain a license to do wood destroying insect inspections? Yes, um, especially if it's regulated in your state. What states do is they regulate pesticide applicators and those pesticide applicators are essentially the termite treatment companies and they do not like home inspectors who perform the visual only inspection. So some states like Florida, you're allowed to inspect for wood destroying organisms you just can't identify the actual bug. You're not an entomologist and you're not a licensed pesticide applicator. So you're not spraying chemicals, but you are performing a home inspection according to a standards of practice. And part of that service is to identify anything that damages the structure, especially the wooden structure of the home. And what damages wooden structure? Well, moisture, mold, and bugs. So you can include that in your report. But if it's regulated and you're not quite sure, sure, take the state test. I did in Pennsylvania. Yep. Um, it's administered by the local office of the um, Department of Agriculture, typically, and they'll give you uh, preparation materials. You study it and then you take the test. So you can write out a form. 
with your license number on it. Um, before I enter, I'm looking at the questions. Um, Mike says, the problem with that, I'm not sure, is what everyone says, just raise your fees. However, you can only raise so much and everyone is in the business of selling. Yeah, so we have a really good home inspection business course, which includes a couple of chapters on um, marketing strategies. We also have a marketing department. We also have marketing videos, and business resources. So one of the things that you want to keep in mind is um, um, that, um, that there's a way to charge a profitable fee. There's a way to calculate a profitable fee. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has nothing to do with what your competition is charging. It has everything to do with math. And so the business course, uh, the home inspection business course, it's actually free and open to everybody. You don't have to be a member of Internet Sheets to take our home inspection business course. There's a, there's a calculation that you have to go through. You have to figure out um, what your desired annual salary is, um, what your overhead costs are. Those are business costs that you have, regardless of whether the phone rings and you do a home inspection or not, like um, office rent um, and, um, and other fees. And then um, your desired profit margin, 20% uh, is good. And you divide that by um, essentially your time. There's different ways to do it. And in chapter 11, there's a section where we go through, um, John, as an example, is trying to figure out what he should charge for an inspection so that it's profitable. So when the phone rings, he knows that it's a profitable phone call. He's going to make enough money to reach his desired uh, salary, cover his costs, and make some profit. So it's about math, and we teach those skills in our home inspection business course. Um, see, Internet Sheet has all the resources you need to be successful, but it's really up to you to take advantage of it. So if you're beginning out as a home inspector, or if you're a veteran inspector and you wanna boost your business, like hire more inspectors and expand, um, we have the resources available to you. You just have to put in the time. So you no longer watch two hours of TV a night, only watch maybe an hour or a half hour. And the other half is up on your business. You, you work on your business, right? So my brother always said that the best way, the best tool to use to increase your business, to boost your business, one of the best tools to use is a hammer. And you smash your TV. <laughs> you no longer watch TV. You work on your business. Um, and it go, also goes back, Mike, to um, value. So uh, I was a home inspector. I operated a home inspection business for a dozen years or so in a really difficult market, um, suburbs of Philadelphia, where there's, what, 200 inspectors, really good home inspection companies within an, an hour's drive, a 20-mile radius. And... Um, we were number one because the value that we provided was so incredibly overwhelming that the cost was worth it. So, for example, you go to Macy's, right, or Nordstrom's or, or another store, and you go to the men's watches, right, or you go to the ladies' watches, wherever, and on the left side, you have the cheap watches, for 10 bucks and on the right side there's a hundred watches and on the right side is the watch for a thousand dollars they all do the same thing in fact watches is it's a commodity in fact, home inspections is essentially a commodity we all are performing a home inspection according to the same standards of practice we write the same report we inspect the same stuff we say the same things we're kind of interchangeable the difference is what? Price, right? And if people shop by price, then lowest price wins. And that's bad. But why are there a hundred watches under the glass? And these are worth $10 and these are worth $1,000. It's because of value. 
the value proposition. So to distinguish yourself in the market, you have to um, show, obviously, the value proposition. So if the value, the perceived value, is much greater than the cost, then you can drive up your price. That's why this commodity, you have 100 watches, some of them are $10, some are $1,000. They, they do the same thing. They, they tell time. Each one tells time. They do the same thing. Can't get much more out of a watch than that. They do the same thing. The $1,000 watch, they can demand it because of their perceived value. If I think that $1,000 watch is worth it, I'm going to buy it. And that's why it's in the case. Because they're, they're all promoting their own distinctive value proposition for the cost. So how do you become the $1,000 watch? Value. And how do you create value? You have to work on your brand. You have to distinguish yourself from all the rest. You have to figure out what you do is different from all the rest. And we teach that in our marketing team, in our consultation services, in our home inspection business course, in our marketing research uh, resources. So we have everything you need in order to increase, increase the, don't get bogged down by the home inspectors at the chapter meeting who are, you know, complaining about the phone not ringing, right? You ask them, well, have you taken advantage of all the internet resources to boost your business? They'll probably say no. So you be quiet and you take advantage of the internet resources and boost your business. Drive that demand up by providing overwhelming value so you can increase your fee. There's a method to increasing your fee. Um, a lot of questions. I'm just gonna go through a couple, um, including picks. Should have read including picks. I don't understand what that means. I had a window far and break and cost me $48 to fix. Yeah, I once went to an ashy chapter meeting and someone told me, a home inspector said, I turned on the dishwasher and it leaked all over the floor. We're all listening, you know, I'm on the edge of my seat. He said, I know, and I, and I resolved the situation. I'm like, wow, I wonder how inspector resolved the situation. You know, I wonder how the ashy group does it. You know, how did, it, how did they resolve this situation where you turn on a dishwasher and it leaks and it breaks and it floods the entire kitchen with water? How do, how do you do it? He said, I replaced it. I paid $600 and I had that thing replaced by the next day. <laughs> that's not a that's not a solution to the problem that's a dumb solution to the problem that's a solution to get you out of business where you pay for things that break during your inspection right you turn on a dishwasher and it leaks all over the floor and floods the kitchen floor gets carpeting wet and all that stuff that's fantastic. That is why you're there. You take a picture of it and put it in a report as a defect, major defect that needs to be fixed. You don't go replacing dishwashers that leak on you during your inspection. You don't go replacing the roofs that leak on you after your inspection. You're not responsible for these things. <laughs> so that actually chapter of meeting was so much fun to go to. I don't know what was going on in that one. Yeah, that's not a way to handle the situation. Right? You're there to find problems. So that's your job, to find defects. Something breaks in your hand, ah, you turn something on and it breaks, boom, oh, that's fantastic. That's why you're there. So if you had a window, I had a window, I had a second floor window, I cranked it out and it fell. Thank goodness nobody was below. It fell out. The whole casement window just fell and smashed onto the second floor, 20 feet below. Yeah, I didn't fix that window. No, I put in a report. Ooh, wow, I turned, I cranked open the window and it fell out and crashed. It's fantastic. Yeah, I didn't pay for anything. Um, Russell, looking at the house from outside, how do you tell the difference between a block foundation and a poor concrete foundation? Yeah, it's just experience. You know, there's certain key things you look for. You know, um, it's very difficult, but after a while, you understand. You even know what the neighborhood is like because you know you've been going around the neighborhoods that are being built and just waiting, 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 you know? 
to market yourself in that. So you know an entire neighborhood is built out of concrete block or uh, poured concrete. I see children playing in the basement. Would you mention anything about opening fiber lessons? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you could put in your report. So there's an entire program about, uh, InterNACHI has an entire program called the Healthy Homes Inspector Certification Program. So you can go in and promote yourself as a certified healthy homes inspector. There's a lot of training involved, but there's a checklist. And at the, and at the end of your service, you're essentially helping someone determine whether there are unhealthy aspects of the home. And one of them is indoor um, air quality or indoor environmental hazards, things like that. Something that could be friable in the air and float and get into your lungs. And so exposed insulation um, is part of that. Um, you could you could be I wouldn't I wouldn't comment upon anything like that unless you're trained and certified. And InterNACHI has those training and certification programs. Good question, James. How much moisture is too much moisture? <laughs> right. Um, your moisture meter will tell you, but I don't really care. <laughs> like I said before, um, if I see moisture indications of moisture with my infrared camera, I'm going to keep my mouth shut until I probe it. If it's wet, if this probe tells me there's something going on, that's all I need to know. I don't care. I just don't care um, what the percentage of the moisture is inside the particular type of substrate, right? That is like bulk moisture. It's not going to get, it, it's, it's going to determine, it's going to tell you whether something's wet with your hand. Um, that's what I, that's the kind of tools I like. The gross aggregate kind of uh, approximations. I don't measure things with a moisture meter and mention anything about the moisture content of the wood substrate. Ah, too much. I just want to know if it's wet. Um, what's the temp for not testing the AC? Some say 60, some say 65, right? Um, it's actually a general rule. It's not in code. A lot of manufacturers will mention something like that. Um, there isn't any consistent standard. However, the general rule of thumb is if it's cold outside, you don't turn on the air conditioner. If it's hot outside, you don't turn on the heater. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, we have a chapter. We have a, uh, a chapter and a, several paragraphs of information about that topic, about what are your restrictions? Do you turn something on or turns, not turn something on? according to environmental conditions. So I would say refer to InterNACHI's HVAC, of course. Can we just test both the AC and the temperature difference? Yeah, so I always turn on both the air conditioning and the heating system. I don't heat the entire um, ambient air. I don't, I don't change the actual air temperature of the entire house in order to test a system. I basically see if it turns on and goes through the entire cycle. Um, and that cycle is described for example, for a gas furnace in the free downloadable gas furnace inspection checklist provided by Energy, we go through the cycle. If anything is abnormal, I put it as a defect. Then I turn on the air conditioning, and there's a cycle for that. So you have to know how, how the components work and how the system works in its cycle so that when you turn it on using normal operating controls, a defect literally just jumps out at you because you've been trained on how things are properly installed, and you've also been trained on how to identify defects, like the common defects, like a rattling fan, a blower fan, obviously, is a, a, a common defect. And it sounds like something, and it looks like something, and you just put it in a report. But you won't be able to tell that unless you actually turn on the system and let it run through the cycle where it's circulating air, for example, in a furnace. So I try to turn on everything, but I'm not trying to change, change the temperature of the entire house. Um, Stevens, where to find it? You email me for a discount if you want a discount to join InterNACHI, and this is only for non-members. Ben at InterNACHI.org. Uh, so, okay. um, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to keep going with the webinar. Another report ancillary in the same report. 
new installation on a furnace. Is it okay at HVAC to use rolled flashing materials to retrofit? Uh, yeah, retrofitting a heating system. Sometimes, you know, you got to put um, uh, a square peg, a, a square in a circular peg hole, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? So you, there's a lot of customizing with the ductwork. Um, but one of the things that I look for is um, unsealed gaps or unsealed um, uh, connections in the furnace ductwork because that's a energy deficiency, even on an existing home. The ductwork should be, you know, mastic, you know, um, painted with that gray mastic sealant um, and then insulated. So it's up to you how far, and we have training materials on, about how to comment upon um, home energy efficiency. Um, okay, I'm, I think I'm gonna keep going with the heating system. Healthy home inspection would be great. Juggernaut inspection services, is, in the near future. Yeah, so we have a full comprehensive nationally accredited healthy home inspection certification program where you get trained and certified and you including checklists on what a healthy home looks like and what a unhealthy home um, looks like as well. According to the standards of practice in the plumbing system, main water shut off valve. Ah, so this isn't a, plum, a public system. This is components of a private well system, and I see that with the tank. There's an air bladder tank giving pressure. There's a shutoff valve. There's a pressure regulator, a check. There's a um, particulate filter, and um, there's uh, some controls for the well pump, and there's the change in um, type of pipe with a, a water valve, and there's the well head outside, and I couldn't open up the cap because the, the bolt was rusted. Sometimes the de inside the cap, the well driller will um, date the cap, uh, date the drill, and the depth, and the gallons per uh, as in flow. So it flows in through the, the regulator and the components, and there's a water shutoff valve, the pressure regulator tank giving pressure. The tank looks good, looks new. Um, there's a control switch, there's a submersible pump, electrical components, there's a water filter, it's not leaking. You become, you can become an InterNACHI certified water quality tester through our certification program. You go to nachi.org slash certification. And on that page, we have over 45 types of inspector certifications, and they're all free and online to InterNACHI members. So if you want to do ancillary inspections, which is where the profit is, you can add, you know, just doing a home inspection is one thing, but doing a home inspection with ancillary services attached to it in a nice package, people love bundles of services. For example, you can do a water quality um, training and certification program online. I think it's about a, a 10 hour course. Um, according to home inspection standards of practice, an inspector shall inspect the main fuel supply shutoff valve and at this house we have a buried fuel tank propane tank and there it is there we saw this before there's a shutoff valve right there pressure regulator the water heating equipment including the energy source venting connections temperature pressure relief valves bracing there's a hot water tank there gas supplied there's the controls it's 40 gallons cold water going out shutoff valve fuel gas shutoff valve, TPR extended to the floor from the hot water tank. Every TPR has a discharge pipe. There's a vent gas connection. And the bottom of the tank looks okay. Did you know there's 14 requirements for discharge pipe on a TPR valve? There's 14 things you could check. Do you know them all? One of them is the discharge pipe can't slope up, has to always be sloping down, has to discharge in a conspicuous place in the same room as the hot water tank. If you see a discharge pipe going through a wall, that's a major defect. If you see a discharge pipe going up, that's a major defect. Um, so what we do is we refer to the code to help us perform good home inspections. We're not code inspectors. We can't enforce the code. We can't 
force anybody to do anything. We just report upon the things that we observe. Well, what do you want to observe on? Well, there's 14 things that describe a properly installed TPR discharge pipe. How are you going to remember all that? I can't remember that. I can't remember what I ate yesterday. So you include the checklist, the 14 things in your mobile software. So you look really smart and you know what you're doing, reduce liability and be efficient with your time. Hmm. Sounds pretty cool. Um, check the interior water supply, including all the fixtures, faucets by running the water and all the toilets by flushing them and all the sinks, tubs and showers for drainage. So this could include the exterior water faucets. You're looking for the water supply to the faucets, to the fixtures, and then looking for leaks at the traps, looking at the toilets for problems, filling up the tubs, the handles, the stoppers, the shower diverters, the kitchen sink, things like that. The drain waste and vent system. Well, this is a clear indication that it's a septic system. That is an alarm system with sensors and switches and buttons and horns and lights. And the electrical line follows the drainage pipe. Whenever you see that electrical lines, multiple electrical lines following a drainage pipe out of a house, you probably have a septic system um, that is um, that has a bunch of uh, pumps and floats. And so that's what we have. So in the rear yard, there's a pipe coming out. It's not a public sewer pipe. That's not a clean out. That's not a trap. That's not a house trap. That's a, um, uh, a port for a septic system. And that's a tank right there. And that's another tank. Um, and you can become trained and certified as a septic system inspector and not need to do any septic system inspections. I subcontracted that out actually, but I wanted to be knowledgeable enough so that I can inspect the components that are related to the septic system that are visible during a home inspection. So um, that's what I, uh, I recommend. And there's the interior drainage pipes. They're all sloped properly, supported properly, glued, adhered. Can't see everything, but you're looking for connections, loose connections, watermarks, cracked pipes, things like that. I love cast iron. I love trying to put my screwdriver through cast iron, making sure the PVC is supported well. There's a water supply pipe in the gas lines. So you're required to describe whether the water supply is public or private. Um, location, oh, there, there's the well. So it's a well, so it's a private well. And it's not a public water line. This is a, a typical common um, public water supply where the water pipe comes through the foundation, through a shutoff valve, through a meter, and another valve, and there's a jumper cable and all that stuff. That's not what we have here. We have a well. The location of the main water supply shutoff valve, yep, that's required. I described the location of the main fuel supply shutoff valve, yep, that's outside. And next to and next to each um, appliance, the location of any observed fuel storage system. Well, it's underground, but I can see where it is. And the capacity of the water heating equipment. That's the hot water tank, and it's 40 gallons. Report as a need of correction deficiency in the water supply by viewing the functional flow in two fixtures operated simultaneously. That's basically in the bathroom. So what I do is I flush the toilet. That means the tank is filling up. I run hot and cold water at the sink. And then I turn on the shower and it should be functional flow and it's subjective and it's in my opinion. Report upon deficiencies in the installation of hot and cold water faucets. That's basically um, hot is on the left, cold is on the right if it's switched, right? Uh, active plumbing leaks that were observed during the inspection. We didn't have any during this inspection. Toilets that were damaged, had loose connections to the floor, were leaking or had tank components that didn't operate. We're all pretty good with the toilets. And you can group the bathrooms together in your inspection report to make it easier for your client to read. Reports that are easy to read and clear to understand provide more value. Um, so you may want to group. It's not uh, required anywhere, but you may want to group the bathrooms together as an easy read. So this is the first floor half bath, has sink, GFCI, 
second floor master bathroom tub. That's the tub there. That's the shower. There's no access to the shower through a panel. No leaks there. That's the tub, hot and cold. No leaks at the valves or the, the P-trap. And the tile is covered by carpeting. There's a vent and a light. Second floor, full bath. That's the hallway bathroom, toilet flashed. It's stable on the floor, tub and shower work. There's no access to the shower and panel is not there. That's okay. Second floor, full bath sink is up fine. The drainage pipes and the valve. Second floor, full bath GFCI. The receptacle is not GFCI protected. So actually do one of these things. Uh, that means this doesn't work. So the GFCI protection is not there. It's not there. So that's a that's an X. So that needs to be fixed. Match.org slash SOP is where the standards of practice is and we're in the electrical section. And this is the fun part. There's a lot to inspect. The inspector shall inspect the service drop, overhead service conductors and attachment point, the service head, gooseneck and drip loops, service mast, service conduit and raceway, electric meter and base, service entrance conductors, main electric service disconnect, panel boards and overcurrent protection devices, grounding and bonding, representative number of switches, including AFCI protected receptacles, ground faults, GFCIs, and presence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Let's do service drop. What is a service drop? Well, electrical service terminology related to the service components is available in our free online course, How to Perform Residential Electrical Inspections. So let's take a look at that because it's kind of handy. to get your terminology right. So taking a look at this picture, the service entrance cable, the SEC, that's the blue arrow. And that's a line of service conductors. Here, the three arrows are pointing to the three service conductors. It's located between the terminals of the service equipment. That's the main disconnect. Could be a main disconnect on the outside, just a disconnect all by itself, or at the main panel, and a point usually outside the building, clear of building walls, where they're joined by a tap or a splice. That's the orange arrows. To the service drop are overhead service conductors. And those are the electric lines from the, like, the telephone pole and it's overhead, and the three lines are tapped or spliced to the um, service conductors. The blue arrow is pointing to a protected or sheathed SE, service entrance cable. That's the thing that comes down the side of a house, typically. The service point is the point of connection. That's the orange arrows between the, the um, overhead service drop or the facilities of the um, uh, service utility and the house wiring. That's the connection. Overhead service conductors are the white arrows. They're also the overhead conductors between the service point where they're tapped and the first point of connection to the service entrance conductor, that's the blue arrow at the structure. And the service equipment is the necessary equipment usually consisting of circuit breakers or switches and fuses and their accessories connected to the load end of service conductors to a building and intended to constitute the main control and cutoff of the supply. That's the service equipment. And it's understood that raceways, fittings, and enclosures, housing service conductors are also part of the service equipment. Meter socket enclosures are not considered service equipment. Meter enclosures do not have interrupting ratings, disconnecting means, or over protection, over current protection. So those are the, the terminologies that we use. That's what the electricians use. So if you're talking to an electrician about overhead service conductors, or SEC, or sheathed SE cables, you should probably get trained a little bit, right? This is the most difficult part of being a home inspector, the electrical, I would say. What's a service drop? We talk about service drop. What is um, grounding and bonding? We can talk about grounding and bonding, and then our electrical course goes over rods, and water pipes, and jumpers, and connections, and oofer grounds. So if you're weak on electrical, 
go to our free online how to perform electrical inspections course. That'll really help, especially the terminology. So we're supposed to inspect the service drop. And the service drop are the red arrows. That's the lines overhead dropping from the telephone pole, right? And coming to the house, right? Going through the splice, the connection, the tap to the service entrance connectors that go to the uh, main disconnect. And the service drop here are the red arrows. There should be 10 feet above sidewalks and final grade from the bottom of the drip loop and 12 feet above yards and driveways and 18 feet above the street. We don't have a service drop. We have an underground service coming up from the ground, from the street, coming up from the ground uh, over telephone pole, coming up from the ground into a conduit, right? So we shall inspect the overhead service conductors and attachment point. Again, we don't have overhead, but in this inspection picture, the overhead conductors are the white and red arrows. They're the overhead conductors and the attachment point are the uh, orange arrows and they're connected at that tap or splice and that point of attachment for the service drop should be below the weather head if installed but we don't have that we have an underground service we're also supposed to inspect the service head gooseneck and drip loops the we don't have that at this house but in this inspection picture just for um, training purposes there's no service cap or weatherhead component in this inspection picture, and the overhead service engine conductors must have a service weather head or cap or an improved gooseneck. But we don't have that again. We have underground. A service mast, service conduit, and raceway. Well, there's no service mast or raceway, raceway or, which is a pipe or conduit in this inspection picture, but there is that SEC, that service entrance cable, and that's here, that's the service entrance cable, that's the mast, that's the drip loop, that's connection, that's overhead service conductors. But we have an underground service through a conduit. There's a service entrance conductor from the meter to the main disconnect at the panel. And we're supposed to inspect the electric meter and base, and we do. I like to grab it, see if it comes off the house. Main service disconnect. It's right there. Two fingers for me means 200 amps. The main service disconnect must be clearly marked. The main disconnect must, must be either inside or outside the house, as close to the service conductor where they may enter the house, where it enters the house. Um, it can't be in a bathroom. No more than six breakers can be used to disconnect the service conductors. We are required to inspect the panel boards and overcurrent protection devices. That's a long phrase for circuit breakers. So there it is there. There's the main panel in this house. There's the main disconnect. And it's labeled 200 amps. The service grounding and bonding. Mm, difficult concepts, but we have the training for you to figure it all out. So we have a, a grounding electrode conductor, which is that uh, copper wire that has some patina on it. Uh, the grounding electrode is the buried rod. And bonding. So bonding is required where needed to ensure electrical continuity and the ability to carry up a, a fault current to the path to grounding. The metal water pipe in a house must be bonded to the service equipment enclosure, and that's by code. And electric bonding and grounding training for home inspectors is available um, in an InterNACHI's free online how to perform electrical inspections course. And we already took a look at that. Talk about what is grounding, here's grounding, grounding electrodes, and the next section is bonding and the bonding components, and what that would include, okay? We're also required to inspect the representative number of switches, light fixtures, rep uh, receptacles, including um, receptacles observed and deemed to be arc fault circuit interrupter protected uh, using an AFCA, AFCI test button, if possible. So a representative number for me is one per room. And there's the fixtures and there's wall switches. You can't turn on everything. It's a visual inspection. And we don't have any AFCI breakers installed in this house. Again, I inspect the home without any regard to the age. And a lot of people will say, well, 
this is grandfathered in. It was built a code back then. And home inspectors usually inspect existing homes that were built to code back then. But a home that was built, let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, have defects, major defects, simply because they were built 15 years ago and code has changed. For example, all counter receptacles in the kitchen, kitchen counter receptacles have to be GFCI protected. A while back, it was only the receptacles near the sink within six feet of the sink. Now it's everything. A while back, there were no AFCI, there was no AFCI protection at all. And now it's required in just about every room there is in the home. So I like to, uh, inspect a home without any regard to the house age. Not without any regard, but I'm not going to focus on anything that um, is related to grandfathering or um, if someone says well, it was built to code back then. Um, all homes with defects were built to code. For example, the space between the spindles can't be large enough for a four-inch sphere to pass through. Many homes I inspect were built to code right? And they were grandfathered or something. But the space between the spindles is more than four inches. It's six inches. That means the home that I'm inspecting right now is unsafe for children because they can fall through the railing because the space between the spindles is big enough for a child's head to fall through. So that's, for me, a hazard, a major defect. And I'm going to call that out without any regard to when the house was built because I know the house was built to code. I know the house was built to code back then, but I don't care. I'm trying to protect my kids that are gonna move in here. So I'm gonna inspect the house according to modern building practices, modern standards. If a house is supposed to have smoke detectors all over the place, I'm gonna put it in my report. Carbon monoxide detectors, I'll put it in my report. GFCI, space between the spindles, AFCIs, I'll put it in my report. Okay, so something to consider. Let's see, where are we? There we go. We're required to inspect GFCIs, essentially. And remember, we had a missing GFCI protection at a receptacle in the bathroom. The kitchen, the exterior, that's all good. Presence of smoke and carbon monoxide, monoxide detectors. Well, smoke alarms must be powered by the building wiring and a battery backup. They need both. They should be interconnected so that one alarm activates them all and you can test them um, each bedroom outside each sleeping area and on each story including the basement carbon monoxide detectors are required for houses that have fuel fired appliances or an attached garage with an opening to the house outside of each bedroom inside of each bedroom with a fuel burning appliance and they're interconnected just like the smoke detectors you're supposed to describe the main service disconnects amperage rating, if labeled, and the type of wiring observed. I have 200 amps and normal um, type NMV. Um, inspectors shall report as a need of correction deficiencies in the integrity of the service entrance, conductors, insulation, drip loop, vertical clearances from grades, any unused breaker panel opening that was not filled. We don't have any problems with that. Presence of solid aluminum brand circuit wiring. We don't have any problems with that. It's all copper. Any tested receptacle that had a problem, um, we don't have any problems with that. Absence of smoke or carbon monoxide detectors, we don't have any problems with that. Natchee.org slash um, SOP is where the standards of practice is located and we're at fireplace. And we do have a fireplace and there's the exhaust on the outside. Looks pretty good. There's a switch, turned it on, it turned on. There's controls. No fan option. There's the other one, other um, fireplace, turned on. Controls, a little dusty, all good. Attic insulation and ventilation. The inspector is required to inspect the insulation in unfinished spaces and ventilation. So in the attic, there's no floor, so I really can't crawl around too much, but I'm gonna inspect the the underside of the roof deck and the structure. And there's the thickness of the insulation, R30, 13 inches of blown in fiberglass insulation. 
Fairlane's looking pretty good. I don't see any defects from the attic access. No roof leaks, no structural problems that I see. And the attic access is insulated. And this is my this is my step ladder right there. And that's my picnic blanket. I put a picnic blanket on top of the shelf if this uh, is a closet access, just to show that um, I'm being clean and, and respecting other people's property. And you're required to inspect the mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathrooms, and laundry area. The kitchen is re recirculating. Ideally, it would go outside. Um, the dryer exhausts outside. We saw the vent on the outside earlier, and the bathrooms have a fan and also windows. Inspector shall describe the type of insulation observed, fiberglass blown in insulation, fiberglass bat, approximate depth of the insulation observed in the unfinished attic area, um, R30, that's good. The inspector shall report as a need of correction the general absence of insulation and ventilation in unfinished spaces. Um, going back to the insulation thickness, it's, it's good to understand about insulation and uh, the way code increases the um, house efficiency by increasing the insulation thickness. So a while back, R30 was good. It's probably now in, in that area, in that zip code, if they incorporated the code, um, it's probably R38, R40, something like that. So you could inspect a house that has inadequate insulation and you can recommend more insulation according to modern standards. I'm sure that someone's going to say, well, it was built to code back then, right? Like a house that is um, 100 years old had no insulation in the attic. And somebody could say, well, why are you recommending insulation in the attic? It was built to code back then. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you understand that concept. Uh, I just don't care if the house is 200 years old or two years old. There should be enough insulation according to certain, some kind of standard, and it's typically code. And you can find that in the International Residential Code. And also, if there's inadequate insulation and you're going to recommend more insulation installed, be sure to add air sealing because insulation doesn't stop air leakage. Air leakage is the real, it, it bleeds conditioned air out of the house if it's not sealed. So adding insulation doesn't stop that especially fiberglass, we call it filter glass, because it's basically a big air filter. That's not the purpose of insulation. You have to stop the air leaks, so it's nice and tight, especially the top floor ceiling in a cold climate, that'd be great. And then add it, uh, insulation. So if you're gonna rec make recommendations, if you find that the approximate depth of the attic floor insulation is inadequate, don't just recommend more insulation, recommend air sealing and insulation. And you learn about that in our online training courses. The home inspector shall report as a need of correction the general absence of insulation. We don't have any, everything's insulated really well, nothing missing. The next section is doors, windows, and interior. And this interior part, you can include the garage, the laundry, the bathrooms, the kitchen, that's what I did. The inspector shall inspect a representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them. Floors, walls, ceilings, stairs, steps, landing, stairways, and ramps, railings, guards, and handrails. So I take a look around the interior and I take pictures of everything that I'm inspecting. Everything seems to be pretty good. No major defects in this house. The windows are great. Representative wall receptacles, switches, ceiling fans. Oh, there's my, there's my truck. Whoops, there it is. I'll put it in the driveway all those big tall ladders, um, no major problems really. I try to inspect a representative number of everything. So it looks really good, no major defects. I make sure I take pictures like this because I don't know what's going on underneath the, the carpeting. I'm not required to remove furniture and carpeting. So there could be a defect under there, but uh, I don't know. I, didn't observe it. Um, the inspector shall inspect garage vehicle doors and the operation of garage vehicle door openers using normal operating controls. So I had a section in my report called garage. And there's three car garage, two openers, and one was manual. I used normal operating controls to see if they open and closed. There's a 10-step 10, 10 checklist for 
um, testing a garage door opener if you wanted to try that. This manual door was locked and it was damaged and there was stuff on it. So it was locked, inspection restriction, it was damaged and it was um, covered by um, uh, storage. So I couldn't get to it. So I put that in report as a, a defect. All GFCI receptacles were tested. The drywall looks good. The structural components look good. Load bearing components, the poles. Inspection restrictions, I can't see everything, not even in the corner there. There's a car in the way. A lot of in inspection restrictions there in that picture. The floor looks good. It's sloped to the opening. The inspector shall describe a garage vehicle door as manually operated or installed with the garage door opener. So I had two openers and one manual garage door. And there's 10 steps to inspect a garage door opener inside this free online how to inspect attic insulation and ventilation interior course. I think Amy was talking about that earlier in the class. And there's the video about the 10 steps. And there are the 10 steps, manual release, door panels, warning labels, springs, hardware, door operation, spring containment, wall button, location of the photoelectric eyes, non-contact reversal test, and then the contact reversal test. And um, we just don't recommend using your hands or a part of your body in order to conduct a contact reversal test. There's another way to do it according to a standard. The inspector shall report as in need of correction improper spacing between intermediate balusters. We didn't have any of that. Um, and also photoelectric eyes were good and no cracked or damaged or fogged windows. The laundry room is a section of my report. I put the laundry room specific items and components in there. There's the electric uh, dryer, clothes washer, braided pressure tested hoses, that's good. There's the dryer vent going out, but there's no catch pan. I like the catch pan underneath the clothes washer. Kitchen, run hot and cold water at the sink, dishwasher sprayer, dish sprayer, the garbage disposal, the drainage pipes, the valves, all looks good. GFCI protection, all kitchen counter receptacles, testing them, turn on the dishwasher, short cycle while I'm there wrapping things up. Turn on the range, the oven, microwave, fan. We have a little microwave detector, tester. You can use that. It's like the shock and awe of using that. Everyone, oh, what are you doing? Well, I'm testing to see if there's microwaves inside the microwave. But you can heat up a, a, a wet rag, um, a cup of water, something like that. And that is our home inspection. And on Natchi TV, the value of Natchi TV is that it's free and open to everybody. And you can follow along. If you want a mentor, you can essentially follow along Internet certified professional inspectors, certified master inspectors, and watch them perform home inspections and write inspection reports according to the standards of practice. So that's a great value of Natchi TV. Internet Home Inspection Standards of Practice is available at natchi.org slash SOP. We are a free online accredited college for home inspectors, and that's at internachi.edu. And everything you need all in one place, we try to put it all on one page. And that's at natchi.org slash everything. And I wanna thank you all for being with me. That was a long course, long webinar, um, but I hope you had some fun. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me again. Um, I have just a few more questions. Um, let's see. I'm looking. Uh, is there, I'll try to reply back to individual questions. Let me see if there's something that I could share with everybody. Um, in, in case there isn't sufficient space clearance in front of the electrical panel, then it is a major or minor issue and an inspection, I had a washing machine in front of the panel. Um, I would call it an inspection restriction. If you have like something blocking the panel, it's an inspection restriction, right? If it's movable, right, then it's not a major defect, it's just an inspection restriction. I can't get to the thing that I want to inspect because this thing is in the way, you know? When the owners move out, everything's gonna be cleared out 
and then you'll have access to it. So this is a great opportunity for you to sell a walkthrough inspection after the house is emptied and just before your client during a real estate transaction, just before your client signs on the line to buy the home, your client has an opportunity to walk through the home one last time. And you can offer that service, right? According to how much money you wanna make per hour, I would say, and walk through and make sure that everything that was inaccessible is now accessible and you can take a look at it real quick and write up a, an addendum to the inspection report. It's a really great service. The other idea also I've been promoting is when you're initially scheduling a home inspection, schedule next year's annual home maintenance checkup. So for every client that you perform a home inspection for, you should come back in a year, make sure everything is still in good shape. Because the first thing you do in any home maintenance plan is to perform a visual inspection. You take a look around and see if everything's okay. And most people just don't have the time or the knowledge or skill to do that. So when you're initially scheduling your home inspection service, schedule next year's annual home maintenance checkup at a discounted rate. That's really smart because now you're scheduling a home inspection and you're also scheduling next year's inspection. So you're filling up your calendar for next year. Wow, it's a pretty good idea. Um, is there a way to test pool bonding? Yep, so um, we have a, a free online course about how to inspect pools and spas, and there's a, a section of electrical in there as well. Any practical tips for testing AFCIs? I just use the button. However, we do have um, Inspector Coach, inspectorcoach.com, inspectorcoach.com. I uh, click the store tab at the top, and um, she has one of these available. Um, it's GFCI and AFCI tester. It's pretty good. And there's, um, I like it. There's also the common GFCI test. You, every home inspector needs this and a flashlight and a screwdriver. And then you can make a ton of money <laughs> with those three tools. Um, no only GFCI in the kitchen, resting on a Right down. Um, so all receptacles in the kitchen need to be GFCI protected. And there's typically two um, GFCI testers. Sometimes it's in the in the electrical panel, but um, yeah, th they all have to be downstream of a, a GFCI device. Um, Rianne asks, are we as home inspectors allowed to write protocols on how to remediate mold or does that depend on what state you are in? I'm in Alabama. I'm not too sure about the state specific. I don't know if Alabama regulates mold inspectors. Um, if they do, then they have the standards of practice by which you follow and uh, including the um, mitigation or remediation uh, protocols. But Internet, she has an online course and inside the course there are um, protocols that you'll learn about how to, um, standards by which you uh, sample mold, take mold samples, and also report upon mold samples, and uh, what are the protocols to fix the mold problems, and how do you clear, um, how do you come back as an inspector and do a clearance of that um, remediation work. We have all that. Um, okay, that uh, looks pretty good. I think we're done with the class. So thank you everybody for um, being with me and taking the class on how to perform a detailed home inspection um, according to the standards of practice. And that's on NACHI TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, live, interactive, online webinars for home inspectors, um, free and open to everyone, NACHI TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV. So I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI. I'll check you out later. Thanks for attending the class and uh, hope to see you on the next one. Bye, everybody.